I don't know how you felt about the 2020 NFL season, but for me, it was over at breakneck speed. I mean, football season never lasts long enough, but in such an unprecedented scenario, it felt like a little bit of a fever dream, to be honest. But if there was one team that matched that fever dream energy, it was undoubtedly the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Within an 11 month period while the world was ending, the greatest quarterback of all time joined a new team and won a seventh Super Bowl title, also making history as the first to do it in his home stadium, because, I mean, what other records are there to break? It's a timetable so incomprehensible, I can understand why people think Brady is the only reason the Bucks were even in the same zip code as the Super Bowl. Hell, he's played in half of them since he first became a starter. But with Tampa's turnaround in particular, Tom Brady was less the superstar and more the catalyst to accelerate a young team's evolution. An evolution that, unlike how 2020 might have felt, did not happen overnight. Some of the more veteran viewers on the channel will know that I have long been a fan of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, so it's pretty safe to say that I've been looking forward to this one. But since any money I would make from this is going straight into the hands of Papa Goodell, I'm super excited this video is being sponsored by Omaze, and in a second, I think you'll understand why. Now, I've talked about Omaze on the channel before, and how they support great causes by offering insane and unique prizes. Like, for instance, oh, here's one. Playing catch and having lunch with Tom f***ing Brady. Yes, the GOAT has partnered up with Omaze to fly someone and a friend out to meet Tom, try on one of his seven different Super Bowl rings, and give your best Rob Gronkowski impression as he tosses you a dime in the end zone. And the best part is, a portion of every contribution benefits Best Buddies, the world's largest organization empowering the 200 million people worldwide with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So if having lunch with the greatest of all time and supporting Best Buddies International sounds like something that you can get behind, head to the link in the description at omaze.com STE and use code STE150 for an extra 150 entries. Again, that is omaze.com slash STE with code STE150 to make your donation and get those extra 150 entries. So a huge thank you again to Omaze. And now, let's fire off some cannons. So let's take a big step back, like all the way back in my knowledge of football. As a kid, I was not a big fan of the Buccaneers. I know, I'm sorry. But having spent the mid-2000s spoiled by watching Urban Meyer and Tim Tebow win championships at Florida, turning my attention to Tampa Bay was like getting hit with a frying pan made of losing. Not only had I missed the boat on their taste of Super Bowl glory, but by the time I got caught up, the Bucks were in the midst of deciding whether or not they wanted to be mediocre or horrible on a season-by-season -season basis. Of course, it wasn't as unbearable as the franchise's cursed 0-26 beginning, and if anyone watching this was a fan in those days, you have my sincere condolences. But the Bucks of the early 2010s had a unique vibe of being just mind-numbingly boring, at least apart from... Uh, the Greg Schiano years. But after a particularly horrible 2-14 season in 2014, new general manager Jason Light would use their hard-earned first overall pick to embrace a new era of Buccaneers football. To this very day, the subject of Jameis Winston's five seasons at quarterback for the Bucks remains highly contentious. You've got people who swear that he'll throw a pick on a running play, and then on the other end, you've got this gentleman, who wrote a 404-page book in defense of Jameis and his Hall of Fame career trajectory. Yes. But this video is not about Winston. Instead, I want to direct our attention to the man I mentioned briefly before, General Manager Jason Light. Because for most of the Buccaneers fanbase that's been tuned into the team for the past half decade, Light was the bane of our existence up until very, very recently. And I'll be the first to admit that. I once thought that Light was a horrifically bad general manager. I'm very sorry, Jason. Bud Light's on me if we ever meet up. But look, things were not always pretty. Light became GM in 2014, but by the end of the 2018 season, the Buccaneers' record under him was an abysmal 27-53, with zero playoff appearances, also building up a very mixed track record through free agency and the draft. There were some home runs, like the best wide receiver in the NFC South, but there were also a lot of misses, and I don't want to have to mention it, but we can't ignore the 2016 draft. We're gonna release you. 
But jumping back to the end of 2018, while Light had just fired Dirk Cutter for failing to capitalize on the most badass start to a season ever, there was also no shortage of people calling for Light to pack his bags as well. But with his next head coaching hire, Light would not only save his job, he saved the Buccaneers franchise as well. Enter Bruce Arians, former head coach of the Arizona Cardinals, lured out of a short retirement by his longtime friend. Of course, at the forefront of Arians' responsibilities would be to fix the Buccaneers' um, we'll say turbulent quarterback situation, but that wasn't the biggest hurdle he was facing when he arrived at one buck place. Tampa Bay hadn't made the playoffs in 11 years, and had finished dead last in the NFC South seven of the last eight seasons. When it comes to looking at a head coach's impact, the toughest but most important thing to achieve is to get the entire organization to believe in your vision. You might have the biggest football brain ever, but once you start losing buy-in from within the building, the wheels fall off insanely fast. Bruce Arians has always understood the value of that, with confidence and loyalty being his two defining traits above all else. Say what you will about his football philosophy, the man can lead. As a result, he quickly amassed the largest coaching staff in the NFL with 28 assistants, a diverse and accomplished group that has followed Arians throughout his career. If Tampa was going to move forward from their disappointing past, they had to abandon the losing culture that by that point was ingrained in the walls of their facilities. But the Buccaneers had been a mess burdened by poor leadership and discipline for years, so despite Arians and Co.'s best efforts, that took more than a few weeks to clean up. I'll state the obvious, and you're not going to beat anybody with seven turnovers. Arians has never shied away from calling out players in press conferences directly, and that was especially the case during the Buccaneers' 2-6 and six start in 2019. However, a clear line was drawn in Week 10, when former Top 10 pick Vernon Hargraves was cut from the team following a win against the Cardinals, with Arians citing a lack of hustle to the ball. But this move wasn't just about Hargrave's poor play in isolation, it was about setting the tone for how Tampa was going to approach the game under Bruce Arians, putting an end to that complacency. And though forging that new outlook wasn't easy on a team that had gone 5-11 for two seasons in a row, it allowed bright spots to emerge on the Buccaneers' young roster, placing them on the path to the Super Bowl well before anyone could have suspected it. On the defense, coordinator Todd Bowles integrated his aggressive 3-4 base scheme, predicated on disguising blitzes and coverages to be able to bring pressure from literally anywhere on the field, making it all the more difficult for opposing offenses to exploit a given look. While the unit went through growing pains in adapting to that new system, especially in the team's young secondary, the bones of that dominant 2020 defense would start to materialize. In fact, it went mostly unnoticed due to... Uh, circumstances, but by the back half of the season, Todd Bowles' defense finished out as one of the best in the NFL, leaping from dead last in defensive DVOA in 2018 all the way up to fifth in 2019 per Football Outsiders. Tampa's run defense, helped in particular by the emergence of Vita Vea as one of the most vicious interior defenders in football, was the absolute best in the NFL. On the whole, you had a 2019 Bucks defense that finished 15th in yards allowed, top 5 in takeovers, 2nd in quarterback hits, and 11th in NFL history in terms of rushing yards allowed. By the numbers, analytics, and a good old-fashioned eye test, once things clicked, the Buccaneers finished 2019 as a burgeoning elite defense. And on the other side, thanks to Arians' high-flying offense, the Buccaneers were 4th in points scored, 1st in passing yards, and 2nd in passing touchdowns. So, from an outside perspective, it certainly seems like in Arians' first year with the team, he had accomplished his goal of getting the Buccaneers back to playing winning football. But the team went 7-9. If you're not a Buccaneers fan, you likely remember one thing about the team season in 2019, that Jameis Winston became the first quarterback in NFL history to throw 30 touchdowns and 30 interceptions in a single season. Remember how I said the Bucs defense was ranked middle of the pack in yards and had one of the best rush defenses of the past two decades? Yeah, well, they would also finish fourth to last in points allowed, and a massive part of that was field position. The Buccaneers ranked dead last in giveaways, and as a consequence, also ranked dead last in the average starting field position of their opponents. I'm no expert, but that's not ideal. I was actually so dumbfounded by their ability to shoot themselves in the foot, I made an entire half-hour video trying to figure out if Tampa could win with Jameis Winston under center. 
and my conclusion was uh, maybe. For Jason Light, there was definitely a decision to make. Do you keep the 5,000 yard passer you drafted with a sky high ceiling and devastatingly low floor, or do you admit failure and call your shot somewhere else? Because for as funny as it was, getting rid of the league's most risk prone quarterback might have been even riskier than keeping him. But and on the other hand, no risk it, no biscuit. Whoa, 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 whoa. Clap the room, I'm coming through. They want to see what I'm about. Yeah, I got skills, do it for the thrill. I'm on a paper route. In easily the biggest move of the offseason, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers finally changed their uniforms to a design that isn't horrifying to look at. Tom Brady signed too. In all seriousness, it was and probably will always be one of the most shocking free agent signings ever. TB12 deciding to hang it up with the New England Patriots after 20 years and six Super Bowl wins to start anew in Tampa Bay, a team coming off a 7-9 record worse than he had ever experienced in the NFL. But if we're talking about turnovers still, Brady had never thrown more than 14 interceptions in a season throughout his entire career. But just like when Arians joined the team, elevating the quarterback position wasn't the only contribution that Brady was slated to make. The culture shift had already begun in Tampa Bay, but now the winningest player of all time would be yet another leader to cement that belief. All of a sudden, Rob Gronkowski was back out of retirement, Leonard Fournette and LaShawn McCoy were Buccaneers running backs, and Bruce Arians' goal of bringing back his ascending defense just got a whole hell of a lot easier. But while talking about free agent acquisitions dominated any discussion about the Buccaneers, let's take a look at what their starters would look like in 2020. Devin White, 2019 draft. Sean Murphy Bunting slash Jamel Dean, 2019 draft. Scotty Miller, 2019 draft. Mike Edwards, 2019 draft. Vita Vea, 2018 draft. Ronald Jones, 2018 draft. Carlton Davis, 2018 draft. Jordan Whitehead, 2018 draft. Alex Kappa, 2018 draft. Chris Godwin, 2017 draft. Donovan Smith, 2015 draft. Ali Marpet, 2015 draft. Mike Evans, 2014 draft. Levante David, 2013 draft. Will Golston, 2013 draft. That's 15 or 16 of the 22 starters the Buccaneers would field. All homegrown draft picks forming the nucleus of the team. Not too bad. Recognizing a weakness from previous drafts, Jason Light had also opted to pay up for pass rushing talent, adding Jason Pierre-Paul via trade in 2018 and signing Ndamukong Su and Shaquille Barrett in 2019, with the latter recording an NFL leading 19 and a half sacks the previous season on just a $4 million deal. Oh, and absolutely not to be forgotten, the Bucks also signed kicker Ryan Suckup, who after providing stability to the Buccaneers kicking game, I have built a shrine for in my room. So having added a couple of other NFL greats to the roster, there were only a couple of problem areas left. The Buccaneers offensive line was still pretty suspect, and their young secondary could definitely use some help. So in the 2020 draft, Jason Light did it again two absolute stud additions in Tristan Wirfs and Antoine Winfield Jr. Wirfs would come in right away at right tackle and immediately step up as one of the best in the NFL, allowing just a single sack on 799 pass blocking snaps. At safety, Winfield would lead all defensive rookies in snaps at 1,034, never committing a single penalty either. But uh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here because for as fun as the Buccaneers might have looked on paper going into 2020, they were by no means going to have an easy time putting it all together. Coronavirus is coronavirus. 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 The coronavirus. coronavirus. Getting a team to fully gel with a new quarterback is a massive task for a single offseason, but it gets a little bit harder to do when you have essentially no offseason at all. Training camp was cut down, social distancing fundamentally altered team gatherings, Tom Brady got so disoriented he walked into the wrong house, it was just not ideal, especially for a QB trying to align in a new system alien to his usual style. So while many had painted the team as Super Bowl contenders already, that painting doubled as a massive target on their back. And once the regular season kicked off, it wouldn't take any time at all for critics to start firing shots directly at it. For the first three quarters of the year, the Buccaneers were consistently inconsistent. Tampa Bay showed flashes where they looked like the super team they'd been made out to be, but there was also no denying that there were major flaws that had to be addressed if they wanted to make a postseason run at all. 
Despite having weapons the likes of Chris Godwin, Mike Evans, and even the addition of Mr. Big Chest Antonio Brown himself later in the season, the Buccaneers' offense looked fundamentally broken a lot of the time. The foremost example of that was in the team's 38-3 pantsing in primetime against the New Orleans Saints, where Brady's quarterback rating was 3.8. Not a typo, it's the lowest in the history of quarterback rating. But it wasn't just New Orleans. In fact, by week 14, the Bucks' win-loss column against teams leading their division was a very shaky 1-4. The defense had issues of its own. Losing Vita Vea to injury had significantly weakened their presence against the run, and heading into their bye, the team had been outscored 49-7 by opponents in the first half of their last four games. So now, those critics were growing louder. There was buzz about the Buccaneers regretting the Tom Brady experiment entirely, rumors of a growing rift between Arians and Brady, calls for Arians to be fired. The Buccaneers were 7-5, and five, but with three losses in their last four, it was exactly the type of media frenzy you get when a Tom Brady-led team looks vulnerable. Overblown? Yeah, of course, but there were real concerns beneath the clickbait headlines. Longer drops were putting more pressure on Brady, and as a result, he had become rushed and imprecise from the pocket. Despite Arian's style, Brady wasn't traditionally a deep ball passer throughout his career, and at 43, that was showing. Going into their previous game, he was coming off of a streak of 19 straight incompletions beyond 20 yards, and was on pace for the second highest interception total of his 20-year career. So entering the team's bye, there were some obvious problems to address, and Tampa Bay was running low on time to address them. A team's response to adversity is the thin line between champion and train wreck. But despite the doubts outside the building, that bye week is where the culture cultivated by Arians and reinforced by Brady showed a clear separation from Bucks teams of the past. While losing is never easy for a locker room, there wasn't panic. When players needed leadership, they had it, and when players were given solutions for the team's struggles by the coaching staff, they trusted them. Taking advantage of weaker competition to right the ship in their last four games, the offense came out of the bye blazing, averaging 37 points per contest. Recognizing where they were missing opportunities, the offense incorporated more pre-snap motion and leaned on the running game more to open up play action. On the other side of the ball, Bowles regrouped and altered his calls, adding in new folds to further disguise their alignments and leaning more heavily on two-man coverages, a change that had been not so subtly suggested going into the team's bye. But those changes paid off. At 11-5, the Buccaneers ended their playoff drought to return to the dance as a wildcard team for the first time since 2007. But they weren't finished just yet. In a game against Washington, the Buccaneers would silence a rowdy Chase Young and hold him to zero sacks in a 31-23 win. In the divisional round, Tampa Bay would redeem their regular season losses to New Orleans in a smothering defensive performance that would double as the last game of Drew Brees' career. Then, in the NFC Championship game, the Buccaneers would shock the one-seed Packers at Lambeau Field, highlighted by a gutsy fourth down call just before halftime to connect with Scotty Miller on a 39-yard touchdown. A massively important addition was the return of Vita Vea, who recovered from a right leg and ankle fracture from back in Week 5, to return just in time to wreak havoc on the Packers' interior offensive line, opening lanes for Shaq Barrett and JPP, who would combine for five sacks. The Bucks had played three road playoff games and earned three road playoff wins, complete with 31 points in each, and now an NFC title for Tom Brady giving him just as many as Aaron Rodgers and Drew Brees. Were the Buccaneers or Tom Brady playing perfect football? Certainly not. Tom Brady threw three interceptions in the NFC title game, but Tampa was by far playing its most complete football all season long, and when both sides of the ball executed, they were exactly the team that they had been billed to be. But despite somehow returning home for the Super Bowl, they recognized they had a different beast entirely waiting for them in Kansas City. Their regular season matchup with the Chiefs was their last loss to date, and uh, it was not a very pretty one. Tampa had a magical run to that point, and no one was going to deny how impressive it was. But among analysts, consensus was pretty clear. The Chiefs were just simply too dominant to slow down. 
after essentially sleepwalking through the regular season to a 14-2 record, Pat Mahomes and Andy Reid had once again found their groove, just capping off a 38-24 AFC Championship blowout against an eager Buffalo Bills squad. While the Buccaneers had certainly been impressive, they would need to be near perfect to best the defending champs. Of course, you probably get where I'm going with this. Play action fake, pass to Brown, Gronkowski, he's gonna score a touchdown! Touchdown Tampa Bay! Left under pressure, he is going to sack at the 21 yard line! Dropping to throw Mahomes, we run a stunt, run a stunt, and we sack him at the 50 yard line! Wow, he's clobbered, fumble the football, recovered by the Chiefs! And Mahomes running to his right, look out, he may run, Mahomes directly, no short the end down, battle intercepted, picked off in the end zone, Bucks are gonna beat the Chiefs! To call Tampa Bay's performance in their 31-9 Super Bowl win masterful would be a ridiculous understatement. Todd Bowles' defensive game plan will go down as a textbook example of how to learn from your past mistakes, attacking the Chiefs' weak spots while also eliminating the big plays that gutted them in their first meeting. With Casey's offensive line battered, the Buccaneers pressured Mahomes 29 times on 56 dropbacks, getting pressure with their front four constantly, but also throwing change-ups like corner blitzes and unconventional looks to prevent the Chiefs from adapting. When you add in the Buccaneers' ability to disguise their coverages, and shifting to a complete reliance on two high looks that had helped slow down the Chiefs in their first matchup, and it was a recipe for a Mahomes offense to go without a touchdown for what was likely the first time in Mahomes' entire life. Devin White was absolutely everywhere on the field. The defensive backs stepped up massively to shut down Tyreek Hill, and Levante David put together a masterclass in physicality blanketing Travis Kelsey. There wasn't a place you could point to on the field that didn't absolutely exceed expectation, not to mention the sweetest revenge moment I've ever seen in my life. On the other side of the ball, it was fittingly the team's shiny free agent additions that led the way, with Rob Gronkowski doing what he does in Super Bowls, Antonio Brown coming up with his biggest catch of the season, and Lombardi Lenny Fournette capping off an unforgettable playoff run with, well, an unforgettable Super Bowl run. Even though they had dominated for 60 minutes, it still felt entirely unreal. In football's most uncertain year, the gamble for Tampa Bay of going all in had actually paid off. I think we knew this was going to happen, tonight, didn't we? While the legacy implications of Brady winning a seventh Super Bowl ring and doing it without his old boss understandably took center stage, in the context of 2020 and just everything that took place in it, the Buccaneers Super Bowl win feels even more special than just that. Of course, that might just be my bias speaking, but Tampa's win serves as really a testament to not only the importance of strong leadership to rapidly overcome your faults, but also in recognizing when you have something special on your hands. A phrase often referenced by Jason Light during the team's pursuit of Tom Brady was the famous quote from Field of Dreams, if you build it, he will come. Not many people outside of the Buccaneers thought that Tampa was a threat to go to the Super Bowl following a 7-9 season, count me in that group, but with the right coach and players in the locker room, Brady recognized there was something special being built there long before he walked through the door. Now, having proven everything that can be proven a season later, Tom Brady will look to do it again, as he does. Bruce Arians, forever a man of his word, would not only get a tattoo in honor of the team's accomplishment, but also went absolutely ballistic in promising to bring everyone back at the team's celebratory boat parade. We're gonna keep this band together, and they know how to win. You ain't going nowhere. You ain't going nowhere either. In yet another insane feat, they actually did it. Arians and Jason Light became the first head coach GM duo to return all 22 Super Bowl starters in the salary cap era. Will they be able to make it two in February of 2022? Well, the odds are definitely stacked against them. But if there's one thing that the insanity of the 2020 season proved, it is that you never, ever bet against Tom Brady.